Ladies and gentlemen, dear fleet colleagues, welcome to the first ever Global Fleet webinar. My name is Leticia Fernandez. I'm content and community editor for Global Fleet. We are glad that you could join us for this webinar on fleet management in Turkey, and we sure hope you will appreciate the time and effort our experts dedicated to preparing this session. For those who may not be familiar with Global Fleet, let me introduce it to you. Global Fleet was launched in June 2013. It is primarily an online platform which gathers international fleet stakeholders and where they can find the latest Global Fleet news, but also premium content such as articles, analysis, market research, case studies, and much more. The premium content of the website is accessible by registering and it is for free. As you can see, we also issue guides to fleet management. Where we focus, in those guides, we focus on emerging markets, which we explore and introduce in depth to the international fleet community. We also organize conferences, which gather the global fleet community, and where renowned fleet experts and fleet managers discuss and shape the future of international fleet management. Last but not least, today we are launching a series of global fleet webinars, and this one is dedicated to fleet management in Turkey. As I mentioned, the Global Fleet team recently explored the Turkish fleet market, and we have decided to shed some light today on this complex yet exciting market. So here is the program of this session. First of all, I will give the floor to Tony Elliott, our Global Fleet expert. Tony will introduce the Turkish fleet market and its specificities, and he will share with us some of the key lessons to bear in mind when doing fleet business in the country. Thereafter, Ali Riza Ari, Supply Chain Manager at Schindler Turkey, will present his case study and unravel the knots in fleet management from an insider's perspective. Finally, it will be the time for you to ask any question you like to both our speakers and you can do so through the chat, fun chat function sorry, of the webinar tool. So, let us now hear more about Turkey's fleet market. Tony, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tony Elliott. I'm very happy to be here today. I'd like to cover the findings on the t Turkish fleet market. I've tried to be as logical as possible when I'm going through this, um, and I hope you find it uh, of interest. Starting on the slide, uh, the Turkish vehicle fleet market is relatively immature. Um, there has been leasing in Turkey for quite some time now, so when I say it's immature, I'm judging it by the Western maturity standards. The average vehicles per, per thousand population is 155 cars per thousand, and this is interesting because in Germany, for example, it is more than three times that figure per thousand population. Uh, we expect Turkey to very rapidly come up to that level. The, the vehicles to employee percentage is just 5%, which is very, very low indeed, and it shows that the fleet market has a, has a long way to go before it is up to full speed, as it were. And one of the, the things that is interesting about the market is that outright purchase is the most common acquisition method chosen. Now, this follows very much the evolutionary progress of the Western European markets where in the 1970s um, this ratio that you see here, the vehicles per employee percentage was also 5% and I think the average vehicles per 1,000 population was less than 155. Now it's taken Europe um, 40 odd years to get to this stage now but we expect Turkey because they're so rapidly expanding to reach these figures much, much quicker. Car tax is based upon the cubic capacity, not CO2. Now this is quite interesting because um, in itself this is quite a crude tax because as you, as you will know, uh, the cubic capacity is, is not a, a, a necessary measurement of how much CO2 a car will produce. In fact, some 2-litre cars can produce less CO2 than a 1300cc car. But I understand that the, the uh, Turkish government uh, is considering uh, right now changing this legislation and moving over to a tax which is related to CO2. 
Electric vehicle penetration is immature. Now, this is understandable. At the moment, um, cars are the important thing to the young people coming into the market, into the professional market. And it will be some time before electric vehicle penetration is mature. There has to be an infrastructure. Um, the uh, roadblocks and the road um, jams that you have in uh, Istanbul especially uh, mean that there is a fear that the, the battery will run out before the vehicle is able to recharge, if the vehicle is able to recharge at all. So it will be a while before that, uh, that electric vehicle concept comes into being. Mobility concepts are immature, but they're growing. If we look at, for example, Yoyo, uh, which is a, 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 a car hire company where you can pick the car up using an identification number or a card uh, at numerous spots on the outskirts of Istanbul to carry out your journey, but you don't actually need a car full time. Yoyo is doing very well and they're growing very quickly. So mobility concepts are maturing quite rapidly uh, in, in, in Turkey. Next slide, please. At the moment, operating lease represents a very small proportion of the total corporate fleet in Turkey. Um, again, this is, is, is uh, a natural evolution. Uh, operating leases uh, took a long time to, to penetrate the Western European market. Um, it will be much, much quicker in Turkey, but at the moment it's a very small proportion. People prefer, really, to purchase their vehicles in Turkey, as said before. One thing that interested me very much was that the total cost of ownership, TCO, is immature in Turkey. And that has to change. I have seen some arguments from manufacturers that say that because residual values are so uh, unrisky at the moment in Turkey, cars are selling very well, used cars are selling very well in Turkey because of the high inflation. But nevertheless, TCO is still going to be a measurement and will tell you how much the whole life cost of the vehicle is, rather than looking at the list price or the rental price uh, as your guide. The TCO really is the way to go uh, in, in Turkey. Price seems to be the primary decision tool. TCO is not. Um, that, as I said before, is something that has to change. A vehicle that um, is cheaper, uh, to purchase is not necessarily cheaper to run over a three or four year period. But the TCO will point that out to customers, whereas the initial price of the vehicle will not. So once again, TCO is the way to go. It seems that the vehicle insurance accident statistical reporting is incomplete and premiums can vary considerably. Um, it seems to be um, quite strange that uh, a leasing company would agree to a fixed premium for three years on a vehicle, which means that they have to increase the premium that they charge the customer because they don't know what the customer's accident record will be over the next three years. It might not necessarily be the same as the last three years. So I, if it were me taking that risk and I was a, a, a lease company manager, as I have been in the past, then I would add to that premium to make sure that I was covered or I would try to recover my losses on previous cars in future car insurance premiums. So it's, it sounds pretty good, but actually it probably isn't, uh, especially if there is a problem with statistical reporting. The price of fuel in Turkey is extremely high, uh, and so far as I can see, the reporting is fairly immature, as is the management of all costs relating to a vehicle. So if the price of fuel is extremely high, then the drivers are going to need to be very carefully managed. Their behavior is going to have to be uh, recorded, analyzed, and managed, because the driver is going to be an extremely important person in the amount of fuel that a vehicle is used. I understand at the moment that there are limitations on the number of tankfuls that a driver can have, but this doesn't really answer the question of managing uh, f fuel expenditure. So that needs to be looked at. Commercial vehicles, um, relatively recent, I think, Ali, uh, operating leasing is inadmissible by the Turkish government. And I understand that there is a lot of work going on at the moment 
lobbying the government to change this this rule and to bring commercial vehicles back into uh, uh, and allowing the operating leasing companies to to lease those vehicles. Next slide, please. From what I could see, the lease contracts lacked clarity. Now, I understand that pricing in, in Turkey can vary wildly and that there are some prices that are so low that they are almost unbelievable, but nevertheless, some customers take those cheap prices. If the lease contracts lack clarity and they are not tight contracts and they are ambiguous contracts, then the lease company has the ability over the next three or four years of the lease contract to take back the money that they put into the very cheap price that they gave you in the beginning. And very few suppliers, or sorry, very few customers actually ask the question, I thought I knew what my car was going to cost me, but actually how much did it cost me? And very few customers in my experience around the globe ask that question, uh, perhaps because they don't want to see the answer. But a lease contract that is weak, um, that is loose, and lacks clarity, and is ambiguous, will allow those leasing companies to take that money back, plus, 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 over the next three or four years. So lease contracts need to be tightened up very, very carefully. You cannot rely on relationships to, to look after your company. Uh, the devil is in the detail, and the detail is the contract. As I said before, operating leasing is expanding, and I've seen estimates saying that the, the market is expecting an 11% CAGR growth over the next four years. That is an extraordinary growth, um, and very, for me, very good to hear. The local lease suppliers are trending towards mature international standards. One thing I want to say about that is that the international standards set out by uh, international fleet users sometimes don't match the markets that they are in. And this is, a, this is a problem from both sides. One, that the local market is not up to international standards, but also that the international standards set by fleet users, international fleet users, are not really in sync, in synchronization with the market that they are in. And both sides need to learn this because for example, asking for CO2 reporting in Turkey is quite difficult. Um, it's extremely difficult in China, for example. So these are demands being made by people sitting in Western Europe who don't recognize that the market they are in is different. The, as I said before, the TCO mindsets are expanding and they need to do so more and more and more. I also noticed very nicely that the fuel management systems in Turkey are outstripping Western European standards. I was very pleased to see that. Um, the system you have in Turkey, uh, where the car is monitored at the point of transaction uh, electronically and not relying on the driver or the cash desk to take the right information, um, is actually setting the standard for Western Europe. And I wonder why Western Europe isn't actually following this excellent standard being set by Turkey. Driver behavioral management is expanding fast in Turkey, and I saw quite a few elements of where the drivers are trained, where their behavior is trained. Because the driver, as I said before, has an enormous impact on the cost of running a vehicle. You can have the best car, you can have the best leasing company, but if your driver is, is, is a very bad driver, then your costs are going to go out the window. So I was very pleased to see that. The only thing I was unhappy about was that it seemed to be the international companies that were carrying out this driver training. And one or two of the large uh, local companies, which are very, very good in Turkey, uh, were, were also trying to push that, that project. But generally, it is not expanding as fast as it should be. But it's good to see that it is doing so. Next slide, please. So just to complete then the do's and don'ts as I see it, do start to use TCO as a means of vehicle choice. It really does give you how much your vehicle is probably going to cost you over the next three or four years or however long you have the cars in your company. It gives you the whole life cost. 
and that is what's important, not just the front end costs. Do start to make lease agreements clear and tight as possible. If you leave the back door open on a contract, that's going to be very expensive for you in the long run. Customers pay for loose contracts. Leasing companies don't really pay for loose contracts. It's in their interest to have loose contracts. So make sure it's tight. Don't rely on relationships. Rely on the contract. Do measure your driver's fleet costs. Bad drivers are the biggest expense with your fleet. Sometimes, of course, the, the worst driver that you have is your best salesman, so you have to manage it very carefully. But nevertheless, they have the biggest influence on saving you money in the operation of your fleet. It is not about, um, it, it is also about pushing the leasing company or the supplier, pushing their prices down at the beginning. But then you need to follow through with that and look after the driver as well and make sure that they are driving properly. It is your asset. It is your your vehicle that you have given to them to use, they should respect that. Generally, if the prices look too good to be true, they probably are too good to be true. The, every car has a price at the beginning and every car sells for a price at the end and every car costs a certain amount of money to maintain. It's very difficult to be much, much cheaper than the competition. It's unlikely that the expensive competitors are being expensive because they want to be, because they have to be competitive to get business. So cheap means probably that you're not going to get the service that you expect. It looks good at the beginning, but it probably isn't good in the long run. You will pay for that in the long run. This is the same in Western Europe. Don't believe in free offers. You will inevitably pay the price. What do I mean by that? Well, if somebody says to you, I will give you unlimited mileage, be very, very suspicious. Mileage and period are the two aspects which determine the residual value of a particular vehicle. When I'm calculating the risk of a vehicle and working out the rental on the leasing side, which is what my job used to be, those are the two factors that I needed, or three factors. What type of car, what is the uh, mileage or kilometrage over the period of the lease, and what is the period of the lease? I needed those three factors. If I don't have those three factors and I offer you unlimited mileage, how on earth do I work out the risk? So I will make the risk less for me and I will charge you more and then offer you something like unlimited mileage. It sounds very good, sounds very nice indeed, but it's improbable. So be careful of that. If somebody says you can have free early terminations, question them very carefully. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by free? And how many can I terminate? So just look at these free offers and analyze what is being offered and test the salesman, the leasing salesman who has come to see you to find out that they have actually thought through the additional risk that is involved in offering that. So don't believe in free offers. So that's me finished now. Thank you very much. And I pass you back to, to, to Leticia. Well, thank you very much, Tony. This was enlightening. Um, now, if you already have questions for Tony, don't hesitate to send them through by using the chat function, as we will come back to them during the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. But for now, we can't wait to hear about Schindler's fleet management strategy in Turkey. So now I leave the floor to you, Ali. Hello, everyone. This is Ali Reza from Schindler, Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, I'm the supply chain manager and fleet manager of Schindler Turkey. Uh, next slide, please. Just an overview of Schindler. Uh, we are a global leading company in elevator and escalator business. We are more than 140 years old and uh, we are more than 60 years old here in Turkey. Uh, Schindler is active in 100 countries worldwide. We have nearly 50,000 employees and we have a fleet of 20,000 vehicles around the world. Uh, actual fleet management is very important for us. Uh, because of uh, a study that we have done of our uh, environmental effect, uh, we have figured out that Schindler's uh, two-thirds of the carbon footprint is generated by our fleet. So uh, safety and environment friendly is our main target in management. Uh, 
And in Turkey, we have a similar situation. We have 300, more than 300 employees and 200 uh, vehicles. And these uh, vehicles are uh, adding more and more every day. Uh, we are a, a growing country and a growing company. Uh, so as our fleet grows, we are facing uh, new challenges uh, to manage our fleet. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In short, uh, as I told before, for our fleet strategy is first of all the safety of our employees and of our other people uh, who are related to our business. Safety is our main issue. Secondly, environmental friendly uh, should our fleet be. Uh, and full efficiency and sustainability is our must in our fleet strategy. Next slide, please. And our, here are some actions uh, for our fleet management globally. Uh, we have eco driver trainings worldwide. Uh, and we are uh, trying to reduce our carbon emissions by 30% uh, from 2012 to 2016. Uh, in order to achieve, it, to achieve this, we are uh, replacing all our benzene cars with diesel cars, also uh, try, uh, trying to implement some uh, filters, uh, particle filters for our uh, fleet in Europe and in America. And locally in Turkey, we are testing every driver and if needed, we are uh, supplying them trainings for eco-driving and safety. We are trying to choose all our cars from uh, safe cars, which are uh, Euro and Cap uh, tested, and uh, all five star cars. Uh, also, our emission standards are the most uh, uh, the latest standards of European Commission, uh, Euro five and Euro six. And also, we have changed all our cars to diesels, including the management cars. Uh, just to be a more environment friendly and fuel efficient. Next slide. Uh, so what we had, uh, what kind of challenges we had? Uh, actually, when this uh, strategy started uh, in Turkey, we had around eight to five vehicles, including minivans, benzene, and automatic geo cars. Uh, they were mostly leased because we, had, uh, we already did our calculations and we started leasing uh, since like 2005 or six. but uh, we had still some our own cars. Uh, we had a diverse uh, vehicle range, I can tell, for 85 vehicles we have five different brands and 12 models. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, just purchase cost uh, or lease cost was taken into consideration when uh, supplying those cars. Uh, so we had to change some, uh, some things. In 2014, now we have 200 plus vehicles. They are all safe and economic diesel ones. Uh, so we have uh, no minivans anymore. We, chosen, we have chosen uh, Renault as our main supplier. Uh, there were two reasons. First of all, they are our global partner. Uh, we have also <coughs> partnership with Renault uh, in order to test their elect electrical cars. In Europe, we have electric cars in service uh, in, Schindler, uh, in Schindler countries in order to decrease our carbon, uh, carbon footprint. Unfortunately, in Turkey, electrical cars has way to go. It's not so logical to operate electrical cars in Turkey. The other one, Renault has a very good product range that could fit to many things in Turkey. Very fuel efficient cars and many options they have. Our target is to have a manageable and sustainable fleet by, right brand, by choosing the right brand and right model selection. And also total cost of ownership approach is our uh, new uh, motive behind our purchases. Uh, this is very important. <clears throat> yes, next, uh, next slide. <clears throat> In 
in order to uh, achieve our uh, strategic targets, we had to implement a change management. Before we had this ownership method, uh, unfortunately, uh, in Turkey, uh, the conditions are changing, especially uh, tax or uh, other conditions. And if you own the fleet, uh, you, it's hard for you to uh, match up uh, and to adopt all these procedures and new changes. Uh, and there are many uh, hidden costs uh, behind uh, ownership. You had to take care of your fleet, you have to take care of the new tax regulations, etc. Uh, I can tell, uh, especially by um, the ban of commercial fleet, uh, commercial vehicles leasing, we, uh, many of the companies had to face this DCO, uh, because suddenly in Turkey it was banned to lease uh, commercial vehicles. And after that moment we uh, had a huge uh, number of commercial vehicles, like minivans in our uh, fleet, uh, suddenly uh, the regulation changed. And at that moment, many companies had only two choices, to buy and to own uh, those vehicles or uh, to go for operational leasing for other, uh, for other brands and models. Uh, there we have seen that the risk was great. Uh, that was another reason uh, that we have gone uh, to all leasing of our fleet, uh, all operational leasing, uh, because the operational leasing companies could face those kind of uh, changes must much 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 more professionally and better than us, and uh, we could uh, outsource our risk to the lease company. Uh, so at that moment we had changed all our fleet to lease. Next slide, please. Uh, in short, uh, we have set strategic targets uh, here in Istanbul, also globally in our field management. Uh, in order to achieve our strategic targets, uh, first of all, the supplier of the fleet uh, as uh, the car producer and the uh, right leasing company was very important for us. So I would uh, appreciate Renault and Fleet Corp to support us during this change management. And I can say that we have a very good manageable uh, fleet right now. Uh, otherwise, it would not be possible for us to manage 200 plus cars with two personal only. Uh, before, I can tell them we had 85 cars and like half of them were, not half, but uh, less than half were owned uh, cars. Uh, it was, it took three people to manage them. But now, more than 200 cars we can manage with two people here in Turkey. <clears throat> so, that was... Thank you very much, my... Ali. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Uh, this was really interesting, and I'm sure that uh, the audience will have plenty of questions to ask. So I propose that now we move to the questions and answers uh, part of this webinar. And there is a question uh, for Tony. So Tony, uh, you described the Turkish fleet market as rather immature compared to uh, countries like the UK, the Netherlands, or Germany. But do you see improvements? And what will this mean for fleet clients? Uh, I believe that, that the, the Turkish market always meets the demand of the Turkish uh, customers. What we need to do is to encourage the Turkish customers to change the ways in which they operate, to come into line with uh, the environmental concepts, for example, the TCO concepts, for example. Just a few minor changes. I mean, leasing, leasing is leasing wherever you go in the world. As I said before, every car, every car depreciates, every car needs service maintenance and repair, and every car needs tires. So there's not that much difference, but some of the more specialist uh, ideas that have developed in Western Europe uh, through necessity over the last 40 years um, have resulted in things like TCO uh, coming into being, which is very, very useful to control the costs and choose the right vehicles for your fleet. 
So I'm not saying that the, the market in Turkey is not up to standard. What I'm saying is that there are some ideas elsewhere in the world from people who have been through adversity uh, where they have come up with solutions which could short circuit the maturity of the Turkish market. Thank you. Um, Ali, I have a question for you. So, um, somebody is asking as uh, fuel costs uh, are very high in Turkey, as uh, Tony mentioned earlier, uh, what do you recommend to uh, your fleet uh, peers to optimize their fleet costs? Uh, hi, Leticia. As Lord, uh, Tony uh, referred uh, in his uh, presentation, uh, we have uh, one of the top systems in the world uh, to monitor the fuel cost. Actually, we are also using the same system in our company uh, that when uh, the uh, tanking takes place, we are directly being informed. And we are receiving these reports from the fuel company uh, and we are uh, constantly monitoring our fuel expenditure. We have set some uh, clear standards for our employees, uh, set, uh, set routes for our service technicians and set limits for them. We are closely monitoring all these figures and uh, in order uh, so that we can optimize our fuel cost. Uh, definitely we have to monitor this cost and in Turkey we have really many options uh, for monitoring our very well. And Ali, in terms of fleet services and the quality of services uh, you, that uh, you have in Turkey, can you see there's uh, a, a difference uh, in quality, um, delivered network, um, road assistance between the big cities and the countryside? Or can you see Turkey as just uh, one homogeneous you know, place uh, when you, you have to deal with fleet? Uh, actually, Turkey is a huge geography and uh, of course we have differences between the regions. Uh, our company is not uh, very operative in very remote areas, uh, luckily, so that we do not face in uh, most of the places any big problems about uh, getting service. Uh, I have personally heard that some companies may have problems in very remote areas, but uh, in our company we had until now with our fleet suppliers, we had no issues receiving service in any area of Turkey. Thank you, Ali. Uh, Tony, um, here's another question for you now. Um, somebody is asking if there is a difference in uh, fleet services and transparency uh, between fleet suppliers in Turkey, uh, let's say between international suppliers and, uh, and local ones. Okay, from what I've seen, yes, there is a, is a huge difference between the transparency that is demanded by um, the, 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 for example, the Schindlers uh, in, in Western Europe and, um, and in, in, in the customers in Turkey. It, it is very much a relationship-based um, situation in Turkey. In the past, relationships have been important, uh, whereas the, the actual costs, the actual translation of um, of, of the costs that the customers expected to pay have been kept um, kept quiet. Now this is quite normal in Western Europe in the 1970s as I mentioned before um, because we used to ask the customer are you happy with the rental and if the customer said how is that rental made up we used to say well actually that's got nothing to do with you uh, are you happy with the rental because if the rental is competitive then can we have the business please of course that's very different now in Western Europe where they say yes thank you but we need to know what is in that rental. So I didn't see a lot of that in, in Turkey. Maybe Ali can make a comment there too because he is actually experiencing the, the situation on the ground in Turkey, uh, which I have not. And I'm looking at it from the leasing company's side. But of the three leasing companies that I have met in Turkey, uh, two international and one local, uh, transparency is not something that is offered and is not and they're very reluctant to release their figures. And of course, the more free offers you make, the less you want the customer to see how you got to those free offers. So I do not see the level of transparency in Turkey that I see in Western Europe. 
Ali, Ali, yes, maybe you want to comment on that? Yes, I agree, Tony, that we do not have that uh, maturity in Turkey in terms of contracts, in terms of con uh, transparency, etc. Uh, I agree. But uh, uh, in a way, I can understand this. Turkey is a very dynamic country. Uh, yes. The conditions are changing very frequently. Uh, and in order to adopt to these conditions, we would like to have a room in our contracts. I can say both of the parts, the suppliers and the customers, would like to have a little bit more freedom in the contracts. Uh, as uh, Europe is much more mature, it's uh, easier to uh, make transparent and very detailed calculations. Uh, unfortunately, in Turkey, it's not that easy. I can give you a uh, very good example. If there is traffic jam, you can get to the airport in four hours, but if not, in 40 minutes. It's very hard uh, for uh, to pre-calculate every detail before and to make such detailed and transparent contracts. Uh, of course, our aim is to uh, receive such kind of contracts. As a customer, I would like to have a full overview of the costs and the charges of the companies that I'm dealing with. Uh, of course, I'm waiting for this, uh, but at the moment, it's not very uh, easy to uh, to obtain. Thank you, Ali. Um, I see here one more question for you because you insisted on how important uh, driver safety is to Schindler. Um, so, um, can you explain how you deal with uh, with this uh, issue and uh, and with accident management? First of all, uh, before supplying a car to any of our employees, we have tests and trainings for the, uh, for the driver. Uh, after that, we supply the car and then we monitor. If uh, there is a high accident rate, uh, we send our driver again to training. Also, we are warning uh, the driver accordingly. Uh, also, we have always safety trainings within our company related to all issues of uh, our work life, uh, driving and also our normal uh, daily, uh, daily business routine. Uh, we are monitoring and training our employees frequently uh, about safety. Thank you, Ali. Um, now, another question for Tony. Um, as Turkey uh, gains importance, uh, it's an emerging market which is growing very fast, um, but there's a lot of complexities to it. Is it easy to establish a fleet management policy for the longer term, or are actions by nature ad hoc? To be honest with you, I think uh, Ali might be of help here on this question as well. Um, for me, yes, the market is moving very, very rapidly. I also understand, and maybe Ali can fill some more information in here, the, um, the exchange rate uh, difficulties experienced in Turkey uh, are quite extreme and very difficult to assess the residual value risk, for example, uh, in Turkey because of that um, exchange rate risk. So to actually come up with a car policy I think is quite difficult in Turkey and I think I think they do a very good job don't get me wrong um, it's very easy to measure a mature country against an immature country but Turkey is a different market and they have different needs and different requirements and they're going through a very rapid change a very exciting change it's a very dynamic country and um, that's one of the reasons why I enjoyed visiting Turkey recently is that they are such a dynamic uh, country where Western Europe perhaps now is, is more or less saturated. So I admire the way that they actually handle the, the difficulties that are there. Uh, and they are not difficulties through immaturity necessarily. They are just difficulties in a country that is expanding in such an exciting way, in such a dynamic way, which we never really have had to deal with in Western Europe. It's been a much more uh, plod, plod uh, type of uh, of, of uh, maturity that we see in, the, in, these, in these very exciting economies. So yes, uh, there are difficulties. I think we handle them very well. Um, and maybe some of the things that I've suggested today 
and Ali has suggested today can help accelerate uh, those those car policy changes. Ali, maybe you want to complement uh, Tony's answer. Uh, I can say most of the companies that I know has car policies. Also, uh, we have as our car policies. But as Tony mentioned, it's frequently changing. I can say in the last five years we had to change our car, car policy uh, three times uh, because, again, as Tony is mentioning, we are an expanding company country, and uh, the rules are changing every day. FX rate changes every day. The taxation changes every day. And the fuel price also. Even the taxation of the fuel is changing. And that's why uh, it's really hard to uh, stay for a very long time on very strict rules. That's why we had to update our car policies. We have to update our strategies of fleet management, of fleet supply, uh, frequently here in Turkey. Uh, that's why we have to be always alert for anything new in the market. But uh, as at the last slide of Tony, uh, we have to be careful about um, free offers or very good deals that may have very huge uh, hidden costs behind, etc. Uh, so we have to be alerted, we have to update our car policies frequently, and we have to be a little bit cautious about every change. All right. Then, well, maybe to conclude, one last question. Um, what is the number one tip you would give to a fellow fleet manager um, who gets into Turkey um, and has to, to implement a fleet management strategy there? Ali? Yes, first of all, I would, uh, I would say a good car policy at the beginning to define uh, the rules, how the fleet will be managed, uh, who will receive what kind of car, and all the details should be written in front. And then to go out on the market and to find the uh, best deals. But if you don't know what you are looking for, the offers could be very uh, different in many, uh, in many ways here in Turkey. Uh, as uh, <coughs> Tony also mentioned, we have international uh, players here in Turkey and we have many local competitors. Uh, that's why the market is very, um, uh, very complex, I can tell you. So in order to be successful, first you have to define what you really need, what is really essential and important for you. After that, you have to go with that car policy on the market and uh, to supply the best, uh, best options possible. Very well. Tony, um, maybe you want to give uh, your one piece of advice, although you've already mentioned some uh, some tools and don'ts, but uh, if there's something people need to take away today, what would that be? I think Ali has summed that up very, very well. Um, what I would say is, yes, uh, it's very difficult to make a good purchase if you don't know what it is that you want when you go out into the market. That's a very good point uh, from Ali. Um, and, and one that people make the mistake in Western Europe as well. Um, still to this day, they don't know what it is they want, and then they're quite surprised when they bought the wrong, the wrong product. Um, the other thing I would say is, is that yes, there are international companies in Turkey, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the best in that country. There are, some, there are always some very, very good local suppliers uh, in every country. Uh, they may operate in a different way to the internationals, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. Although I think the international companies will always say that something different is wrong. Um, it, it isn't, as we've seen in Brazil, China, South Africa, and, and, and Turkey. Um, so look at the local market, work out what it is you require, find out if that market is able to offer those things that you require, and moderate your requirements according to the, to the market um, and focus on those things that really, really matter in a fleet, not all of the nice things that you can add on after you have the fleet policy right. That is, the, that is what I would suggest. Well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to you both, Tony and Ali. Um, uh, this is it, I guess. Um, 
Well, I wish to thank you all, and especially uh, our speakers, Tony Elliott and Nali Riza Ari, for sharing their expertise with us today. I hope you all found this webinar as enlightening as I did, and that you will take away some lessons learned and best practices. Um, Please note that uh, this webinar has been recorded and that the video will soon be available at the Global Fleet website for you to watch again or to share with your peers and colleagues. Also, when you exit the webinar, you will be invited to fill out a short satisfaction survey. Your answers to this questionnaire are highly appreciated since they will help us improve future webinars. And last but not least, should you wish to learn more about fleet management in Turkey, you can always refer to our website and to the guide to fleet management we issued earlier this year, which is available for purchase on our eShop in both digital and hard copy, and you can even choose the language as uh, it's available in both English and Turkish. So once again, thank you all for joining us today and have a smashing day.